All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Um, you know, I've been really interested in uh, some of the comments about the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the brain um, and, uh, and, and, and what's going on there. And so uh, I reached out to uh, two gentlemen. Uh, one is a, a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Western Ontario. His name is Adrian Owen. The other one is a uh, medical doctor at uh, Sunnybrook and a professor um, at, uh, of medicine at the University of Toronto. His name is Rick Schwartz. Um, gentlemen, um, please explain what is this issue that uh, people are talking about and what is the research that you're doing? One of you. Okay, well, uh, why don't I start? Yeah, so, um, you know, as more and more people are recovering from COVID-19, we are seeing uh, that many of them are developing neurological deficits. And some of these take the form of cognitive impairments, problems with things like memory, concentration, even simple day-to-day decision-making. A lot of people describe this as, as brain fog. And yeah. what we really want to do is to get to the bottom of, you know, what, what is that brain fog? Who's getting it? Is everybody getting it? Uh, how long does it last? Um, is it something that is only affecting some patients and not others? How is it related to their symptoms? These sorts of things. It's a story that I think is going to unfold uh, over the next year or so. And so what is the research that you're doing? You're studying people in a clinical trial or what? What we've done is we've set up a website at covidbrainstudy.com. And what we're doing is we're asking people to log in there uh, if they have had COVID-19. Now that means they've either been tested or it's been verified by a medical professional. Uh, we're then gonna collect details about what happened to them. They can answer questions about uh, you know, what symptoms they had. Were they in hospital? Were they ventilated? Were they on sedation? These sorts of things. It's all completely confidential, but of course we want to know this anonymous information about people so we can match it up with their cognitive performance. Then they're gonna do um, some cognitive, uh, they're really cognitive games. They're online games. They test things like memory, problem solving, concentration. Uh, and we're gonna put all that information together and try and work out what is the relationship between this virus, COVID-19, and its effects on the brain. Now, are you gonna be trying to help people get better or just testing to see if there is a cognitive impairment? So we're gonna be hoping that people get better. Uh, we are gonna be testing them at baseline and then following them along. And we're actually just in the midst of working on uh, trying to get people access to their own information. This has to go through the research ethics boards and everything. So it's not currently up and running, but it's something that we're uh, hoping to add as a feature for the, for the longer term, the repeat studies, so that people can actually follow their own um, progress and, and maybe uh, really see where their strengths and weaknesses are and, and work on some of the things that, that might help them improve further. So maybe you can explain to me how this actually potentially happens. So initially we thought that, you know, this impacted the respiratory system. Then I've heard comments about it, hap it, it affecting the uh, vascular system and causing, um, you know, uh, uh, clots and things like that. How does it impact the brain? Is it, is it through the vascular system and it's creating blood clots in the brain or something or what, what's happening? So there, there's probably multiple different ways that the brain is being affected. And that's really where this all started is, uh, uh, myself and, and, and Adrian speaking about what what we think is going to happen, what we think we're going to start to see. And early on, when it was described as respiratory, um, my early thinking was that we're going to see, uh, I'm a stroke neurologist, and, and uh, we're starting to get very early clues that maybe this virus was contributing to blood clots. So we thought maybe we're going to see some, not just symptomatic strokes, but what we call covert strokes, the kind of things that maybe get lost, don't cause obvious symptoms, but certainly are known to affect people's thinking and memory and multitasking. So the first question is covert strokes, and that can be because it makes the, the virus and the infection make people prone to form clots as one possibility. It's actually become a little more obvious that there is, as you were kind of alluding to, there's effects of the lining of the blood vessels themselves, the vascular endothelium. So that can actually make the blood vessels more clotty, more sticky. Then there's effects on the body more generally and on the brain specifically of inflammation. Um, so the virus we know is getting into the brain. That's one of the reasons why people are losing their sense of smell, for example. Uh, so there can be inflammation. Good. So the that the loss, the, of, the loss of smell isn't because it's some, somehow blocking the respiratory system. It's actually no, it's a direct somehow effect on impacting the, olfactory the brain. Nerves. Yeah, it's a direct really? effect on the olfactory nerves. Yeah. Um, I had one person tell me that the problem is a cytokine storm. What is a cytokine storm? So this is the cytokines are uh, 
proteins that your body uses to fight infection. And the, the virus and the infection themselves aren't a cytokine storm, but in some people, uh, you get this almost overreaction, uh, this immune overdrive that tries to fight off the virus. And that's what people refer to as a cytokine storm. And some of the damage that we're seeing people who get severe lung injuries, people who require ventilators, uh, people who are very, very sick from the virus may in part be because of immune overactivation. It's one of the interesting things was this study that came out a few months ago showing that steroids, which are immune suppressors, um, actually improved survival uh, in people with COVID. So it kind of maybe calming down a little bit of that cytokine storm, the immune system overactivation. We're chatting tonight with uh, two professors, one uh, a medical doctor from Sunnybrook and a professor of medicine at uh, U of T and the other a professor of, uh, of cognitive neuroscience uh, at the University of Western Ontario. We're gonna take a break for some messages and come right back and talk more about the impact of COVID-19 on the brain. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. As I mentioned uh, at the top of the hour, um, I've been really interested on the uh, impacts of COVID-19 on the brain that we've heard uh, a little bit about and read a little bit about. And uh, Adrian uh, Alan Owen is a professor of, uh, of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Western Ontario. And Rick Schwartz is a, a physician at Sunnybrook Hospital, as well as a professor of medicine at uh, U of T. Uh, and they both join me tonight to talk about this. Um, Adrian, maybe I could just ask you to start with, what is cognitive neuroscience? Cognitive neuroscience, well, it's a, it's a discipline that really emerged out of the interaction of psychology and neurology. You know, when I started my career back in the late 1980s, uh, we were all called, at least in my profession, we were called psychologists back then. Uh, and gradually, uh, around about that time, late 80s, early 90s, when things like uh, brain imaging came along, a lot of psychologists moved more in the direction of thinking about the brain, trying to understand the brain, trying to map the brain. A lot of the early work I did was either with patients who had specific types of brain damage or in, uh, it was in brain imaging studies in which we put healthy participants or patients into brain scanners and tried to work out what was going on in their brains. And that's really, that's really how the discipline of cognitive neuroscience emerged out of both um, cognitive psychology, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So um, help me understand how you know whether uh, COVID-19 has actually had an impact on the brain. Uh, is it just based on questions that you're asking and qualitative uh, responses, or is there some imaging or some tests that you can do on the brain that will tell us whether definitively there has been something? For example, I presume if you have a blood clot, you can do um, something and see the blood clot in the brain. Right, yeah, so all of those things are true. Um, I mean, this, the tests that we are asking people with COVID-19 to take have actually been in development for more than 30 years now. Um, they, they started, um, we started developing them by looking at patients who'd had, actually had parts of their brain removed, perhaps for uh, surgery, for the relief of epilepsy, for example, or for the remo removal of tumours. And by looking at how those patients were impaired on these tasks, we could find an association between a particular brain area and an impairment in a task. If a person with a damage to their frontal lobe was bad at the task, for example, we know that that task needed the frontal lobes. And then sort of through the 90s and the early 2000s, we did a lot of uh, studies in uh, using brain imaging, using te uh, techniques like PET and fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. And there again, we would put people into the scanner and have them do these tasks and see areas of the brain respond. And that's how we'd know, hey, this, this part of the brain is, 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 is how we perform this task using a particular area of the brain. So through this about 30 years of development now, we have really, we know a lot about these tests and we know a lot about which bits of the brain and which brain networks are involved. So when we see an impairment in a new type of patient, like a patient with COVID-19, we can say, hey, this person has a problem with their brain, but we can go further than that. We can say the problem is this specific type of brain problem. It's involving say the frontal lobes of the brain or the back part of the brain, or the, the parietal cortex. We can really get quite specific about what the problem is likely to be based purely on performance of the tests. Do you think that uh, the impact on the brain is by people that are symptomatic um, or also people that were asymptomatic? Uh, or has it got to be people that, you know, have gone into hospital and been on a ventilator? How severe does the impact of the virus have to be before they get uh, brain fog? 
So that, that's one of the big questions we're trying to ask. You know, I mean, intuitively, I think we would all think, well, probably that the worse your symptoms, the worse the effect on your brain is going to be. That seems to be a reasonable uh, intuitive thought, but we don't know that. And there are certainly uh, people who are relatively asymptomatic who are complaining of so-called brain fog. So the only way we can really look at this is to recruit a large number of people, uh, some who are symptomatic, some who've been in hospital, some who've been on ventilators, some who are asymptomatic, and then find out just how pervasive this problem is and if it's, if it's just particular groups of people or whether it's everybody. Chris Cuomo, a uh, columnist on, uh, on CNN, um, had COVID-19 and uh, complains about brain fog and, you know, unscientific, obviously, but he says he thinks it's because he had such a high fever for such a long time. Is there an impact of having a high fever for a long period of time? Well, so we were alluding earlier to the different effects, the blood clot themselves, the vascular lining, the vascular endothelium, and then the inflammation. Uh, and people who are actually hospitalized or in the ICU may have even a fourth, which is just all of the drugs and low oxygen levels and the things that happen to people who get very, very sick and are in the ICU. So uh, a high fever, the cytokine storm that you talked about earlier, that inflammation that's taking place can definitely affect the brain, even without strokes. And we suspect that there's probably microinfarction going on as well. So uh, there's probably more than one mechanism here that's leading to the, the symptoms of brain fog. Please explain if I could, if you could. Um, so if you're not getting a clot or a stroke, how is it impacting the brain? That's a great question. So uh, if you aren't getting good oxygen, for example, so if you have really low but isn't oxygen that levels, a, and, isn't and that, that is a feature of... Uh, well, so generally, if your whole body is not getting good oxygen, because if your lungs are involved and you're not breathing well, we're seeing people with, uh, with COVID-19 having a lot of what we call silent hypoxia, where their, their blood oxygen levels are dropping, even though they don't feel short of breath. They don't feel uh, particularly affected. And some of the oxygen monitoring that they're doing of people who are asymptomatic is showing that their oxygen levels are actually dipping fairly significantly. And those that are very sick, those that end up being ventilated, having, you know, uh, having tubes helping them breathe, one of the big reasons why they have to be ventilated is because they're just not getting enough oxygen to their body. And is, is so, that because there's stuff in their lungs or because of the cytokines that are, that are you know, inflaming the lungs or what is it? So it, there's a lot of uh, research going on in this area right now, and it's, it's a, again, a combination of things. So they are seeing microclots in the lungs, so small little lung emboli. We're seeing inflammation and sort of gunk in the lungs, to use the scientific terms. Gunk. Uh, that's a good gunk. scientific term. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, as the lungs get congested, that's definitely, uh, you know, that, that cytokine storm uh, causes blood vessels to constrict. So there's, there's, so they're not exchanging oxygen properly. So it's, it's probably multifactorial. There's, a, there's multiple reasons why people's oxygen levels can, can drop. But just going back to that for a second, the low oxygen, the high temperature, um, just, and the inflammation in the brain, those, those various combinations, even without a clot, even without a stroke, can cause people to have brain fog because the brain cells can get injured. The neurons can be basically upset and hurt. Uh, the supporting structure of the, the, those brain cells, the astrocytes, the glia, these are the, the cells that really help clean up the brain and uh, prevent uh, you know, toxicities from building up in the brain. Those cells can get overwhelmed and not be able to do their job as efficiently. And uh, your sleep is disrupted. And we know that sleep helps clean out the brain. And COVID definitely is affecting people's sleep. So there's, there's a number of different reasons why people can have brain fog, even in the absence of a stroke. I had an interesting conversation with someone at some point in time that said that the problem often in the brain isn't oxygen getting to the brain, but um, the veins that aren't taking the blood out of the brain as efficiently as they could and causing iron deposits and other things in the brain. Does that make any sense? It does. That theory was really postulated around MS a lot. It um, hasn't really been proven. Um, but, but at the small vascular level, at the microvasculature, and uh, at the level of removing toxins from the brain, removing um, you know, proteins like amyloid protein that cause Alzheimer's disease, we definitely know that there are parts of the brain that's not even as simple as arteries and veins. Uh, there's a whole, what they call it, glymphatic system, which is almost like the lymph nodes in the lymph system in your body uh, that drain out toxins that are very active when we sleep. Uh, 
these kinds of areas may be operating less efficiently so that our brains are not able to process uh, the, the bad stuff that can build up and that can affect the neuronal functioning. There was a bunch of comments a month or so ago about a bunch of children having some um, impacts that had a fancy word associated with it. I'm not sure if you re recall what I'm talking about, but uh, have, have you seen this impact in children? I'm not sure what you're alluding to. I thought it was like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or something like that. They said that uh, children with, uh, with COVID-19 had symptoms very similar to some other uh, disease that they were commenting about. Uh, was it Guillain-Barre syndrome? No, that wasn't the word. I'll, I'll figure it out. Anyway, what about children? Is this an impact on just adults, old adults, uh, the elderly, like uh, people above uh, 60 or 80, or is this something that's an impact for children? So it's definitely not just a disease of old age. We know that. Um, I think the risks of having the severe reactions are definitely higher in the older age categories. Um, that, that is becoming more clear and, and was becoming more clear, I think, through the spring and summer. Um, in children, there are rare children who have had severe reactions and even fatal reactions to COVID, which is tragic. Um, but I think the proportion of children with very severe illnesses is much smaller, and that proportion goes up uh, with age, generally speaking. So if this is having an impact on the vascular system, on, uh, on the brain, um, on a whole bunch of things other than sort of the ventilation and the respiratory system that we were initially worried about, are we rushing back into school too quickly? So this is a really complicated question for a lot of us. Uh, I think for, the whole, for our whole society, I think those of us who are parents of school-aged children are all wrestling with this. I know I am. Um, as, a, as a neurologist, I think Adrian, uh, Dr. Owen can comment this as a, as a cognitive neuroscientist, um, there are a lot of benefits to having children in school. Um, and generally, outside of COVID, there's not a lot of risks. Um, there are some, but the benefits far outweigh those risks. Uh, in the current setting, our risk-benefit analysis has is, is is become much more complicated. Um, if you're in a, an area with very low population prevalence of COVID, um, then the risks of, of congregating anywhere, but especially schools, is lower uh, than if you're in a, a very high outbreak setting. So, you know, different people peg that number at different places. In the U.S., they're putting that number at 5%. And many of them have a population, if you just look at blood tests done uh, or, or COVID tests done, their, their positive rates are way over 5%. Uh, in most of Ontario and most of Canada, the rates are far under, you know, many places are under 1%. Um, and that's a really important statistic. The safest way to go back to school or to go back to economic reopening is to have our population level of transmission as low as we can keep it. And that means testing frequently, that means hand washing and masking and, and, and uh, physical distancing. It means when we find people who are positive, we have to do the contact tracing and the isolation. So even if we do go back to school, one of the, the big debate right now is really around, can we physically distance as much as we'd like to when we go back to school? That's really what all the discussion boils down to. And the answer is we don't know. Some classrooms will be able to do it great. Some classrooms won't. How big an impact will that have? This is all a statistical challenge. Um, you know, one meter of distancing is better than sitting side by side. Two meters is better than one meter. Probably four meters is better than two meters. But at some right. point, you have to draw a practical line. And how we implement that as a society, I think, is definitely complicated. Um, but we also have risks of not sending children back to school. And we're balancing those risks, I think, as a society, uh, I, and unfortunately, no one in the world knows exactly what the right answer is. But I worry that uh, parents, too many parents are making this decision, and maybe governments as well, based on this perception that uh, the vast majority of mortality comes from the elderly. I think the statistic in Ontario is 80% of the mortality has been in uh, long-term care facilities. Um, that uh, the kids, if they get it, uh, are asymptomatic at worst, um, and, uh, and, and you know, may not get it at all, even if they're exposed to it. Uh, and so therefore there's not much of a, a risk. But if what you're saying is that even if people don't get put on a ventilator, they may, they may have vascular problems or brain problems, that's a real concern. Uh, I know there's ethics issues in regards to studying children. Are you gonna be studying in your 
in your process, uh, uh, all age groups or just uh, adults? Well, you know, there are limits to the ages that can take our tests, okay? I mean, these are tests that were designed for adults. I mean, certainly anybody from about the age of seven or eight is perfectly able to take the test. And this is something that, uh, you know, we will be interested in, in, in looking at to see whether, uh, the, you know, these are, the, uh, all age groups are being affected equally or whether different age groups are being affected in different ways and perhaps different neural and cognitive systems. You know, perhaps some people's memory is being more severely affected. I mean, this is the problem with expressions like brain fog. I understand why people use word, you know, use expressions like that, but of course it doesn't really mean anything uh, to any of us that really study the brain. And one of the questions we're trying to get at here is, well, what is brain fog? And is it the same for everybody? Uh, I think the, the, the best way I can probably articulate it is a problem of concentration or attention. That's how we, those are the words that we tend to use. Uh, in, in cognitive science to describe what people call brain fog. But, you know, who knows? I've had reports from people that are complaining about memory problems uh, right now, even problems with making simple day-to-day -day decisions. So I think we need to unpack all of this and try and unpack, uh, you know, whether it's affecting all age groups equally. We really don't know. I mean, again, as Rick said, it's a very, very complicated problem, as, as all of these things are, uh, and it also depends on what, what pre-existing conditions you have. You know, if you already, if you're already an elderly person, if you're already in a care home, perhaps you already are in the earliest stages of dementia, then this is very likely going to play out very differently for you, even only in terms of the effects on your cognition, than it's going to be in, you know, a young 20-year-old, otherwise healthy, completely cognitively A1 person. And again, these are, these are the sorts of things that we want to try and unpack with this study. Oh, that's uh, going to be incredibly valuable because I fear that too many people, um, maybe particularly young people, um, think this is only a disease of the elderly. Um, and, you know, I think the statistic is there's something like 1% of the population live in long-term care in Ontario and 80% of the mortality has been in long-term care. So it's unbelievably disproportionate to uh, um, Lee impacted that uh, population. And then I also heard that 60 to 80% of the people in long-term care have dementia. Uh, and so therefore, you know, this is really impacting people that have got dementia. But if all of a sudden you found through your study that people that are in their 30s and 40s and 50s um, get this disease and recover, but have long-term uh, mental impairment, that's pretty interesting and scary. Yeah, well, this is, uh, you know, this is what I always say, that you can't even begin to think about how you uh, mitigate against problems like that until you fully understand them. And this is really, in some ways, this is a, a huge scoping study. We're really trying to work out where the biggest problems are, uh, what the differences are between people. This is why we're trying to recruit many tens of thousands of people, because all of these different things we've talked about, all play in, and any one person is going to respond to COVID-19 in a different way than the next person. We need to try and unpack why that is, because it's only when we understand exactly what's going on to who and why that we can begin to think about therapeutic strategies or, or, or putting things into place to, to, to deal with the aftermath. Adrian, is your website up and running? It is, yes. It's covidbrainstudy.com and uh, people are logging in every day. Uh, we're up to several thousand people already in, in a very short time. So, Just in Canada uh, or global? Oh, it's globally. In fact, we have about e e right now we have about equal numbers of people from Europe and from North America. So we're, it's available in three languages, English, French, and Spanish, but we're inviting anybody who's conversant in one of those three languages from anywhere in the world to log in and join the study. Well, it sounds like a very important piece of uh, research. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back uh, with these two uh, professors uh, in just a minute to hear more about uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on the brain. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Well, I'm having a fascinating uh, time tonight. I hope you're uh, finding this interesting with uh, Dr. Adrian Owen and Dr. Uh, Rick Swartz. Um, Mr. Owen, Professor Owen is a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Western Ontario. Dr. Rick Swartz is a doctor of, uh, what did you call it, neuro, uh, neuromedicine? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a neurologist. Yeah. A neurologist, sorry, I apologize, yes. at Sunnybrook Hospital as well as being a professor at, uh, at U of T. Um, and what they're doing is they're studying the impact of COVID-19 on the brain. And you probably heard um, just of late, a lot of people commenting that there's a lot of impacts of COVID-19 um, that are more than just uh, the impact on, uh, on the respiratory system. Um, Adrian, you were mentioning during our break that uh, just going into the ICU is a major issue. Can you elaborate, please? 
Yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons why, you know, we know that this is going to be a problem. I mean, a lot of people will, you know, will push back, I think, and say, well, how do you know that, you know, people are going to have problems? Well, we know for a number of reasons. So one is uh, that just going to the ICU uh, is not good for your brain. We, we published a study last year uh, of 20 participants that entered the ICU ostensibly for, for non-brain related issues. They had things like sepsis, you know, poisoning of their blood or a cardiac arrest. Um, but they all, every single participant left the ICU with cognitive problems. Now, I wish I could tell you exactly why that was. And, and, and Rick made Is that mental point. health issues, not uh, a physical issue? Uh, yes, these are problems with things like memory, concentration, decision making, problem solving, all the sorts of things that people end up describing as brain fog. Now, there are many, many reasons uh, for this. I mean, it could be because some of these people ended up on a ventilator and being on a ventilator does interrupt the supply of oxygen to your, your brain. Uh, many of them are on a very... Uh, heavy duty sedatives while they're in the ICU. We know that anesthetic agents and sedatives can have effect on your cognitive function. Uh, if, anybody, if anybody listening has been in the ICU, you will know that you do not get much sleep in the ICU. There's an awful lot of interruptions. There's machines going ping all over the place. Uh, so you don't get a lot of sleep. And of course, you've got your original problem, whatever that was, be it, uh, you know, say it's a cardiac arrest. Now, I mean, that's a really good example, I think. A lot of people will say, well, cardiac arrest, that's got nothing to do with the brain. That's all about the heart, right? Well, uh, outside of pandemic times, what I do most of the time is, is uh, see patients who've had very severe brain injuries, who are in a coma or in a vegetative state. Many of those patients have had a cardiac arrest. Uh, and what happens is that interrupts the flow of oxygen to the brain, and they end up with a brain injury, as Rick was describing earlier, that is caused by uh, the cessation or the, the, the uh, reduction of normal blood flow to the brain. And so all of these factors are playing into it. And, um, you know, again, this study is really aimed at trying to unpack uh, what the most important of those things are in the case of COVID-19, because we really don't know. But we do know there's going to be a problem a year from now. So what's, your, what's the status? You're in front of the ethics uh, boards right now for approval? Studies up and running. Um, so we have research ethics board approval. Uh, we're, we're really running the research ethics through one site, but patients are being recruited from around the world. So they're not actually, we're not collecting data from hospitals around the world. Patients are giving uh, their own consent and they're giving their own data. And so we have research ethics approval through uh, Western University, uh, where Dr. Owen is, and patients have, have already been on. So uh, it's COVID brain study, can be Googled or uh, you know, looked up. You can just enter it into your covidbrainstudy.com. And people are filling out the surveys and taking the tests as we speak. Um, I think the challenge really is there's so much COVID news out there right now. Uh, getting in touch with survivors and making sure that they're interested in doing this is, is really the hardest part of the study. And you're interested in people that were asymptomatic, symptomatic, as well as people that were very ill. Exactly. And actually, as you were talking about earlier, one of our, uh, our core hypotheses, one of the big things we're looking to test is comparing those, those four groups of people. So people who uh, got a diagnosis despite having no symptoms, maybe because they knew somebody who was sick and got tested. We want people who have symptoms, but were well enough that they were able to stay home or stay in the community. We want people who were uh, positive but had to be hospitalized. And if we get enough, we'll look at the subset of people who had to be in, in the ICU or ventilated. So we want to compare those different groups. And in addition to comparing differences between men and women and across age groups and all of these kinds of different uh, categories that, that Dr. Owen was talking about earlier, to really try to understand some of the factors leading to the brain fog that people are complaining about, uh, who's getting it, why they're getting it, how long it's lasting, how severe it is, so that we can uh, hopefully give them back some of their own data to, to help them improve uh, eventually, um, and so that we can understand really the impacts of this and design strategies down the line. Uh, because unfortunately, I think this isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, you know, when, when we first started the study, uh, I think when we wrote the research ethics, when we first, very first started, we were about 4 million people, maybe 3 million people worldwide. When we, uh, I think our, our first draft of the grant was 2 million people. Um, right. And then we kept scratching that out and putting in a higher number. When the research ethics board, we were at 8 million. And that was only, I, I can't even remember the date, a couple months ago. 
Um, and so now we're, we're, we've doubled, more, more than doubled that. Sorry, Dr. Ron? Yeah, well, I mean, we're well up over 20 million now. So, I mean, uh, this isn't a problem that's going to go away anywhere, any, anytime soon. And I mean, the important thing is a lot of those people that are reporting uh, impairments, these are things that have been going on for some time. These aren't people who say, you know, I was tested last week and I've got brain fog. There are plenty of people out there that are saying, you know, I've had this since March and I, I still can't think straight. So this is, this is a problem that is going to go on for a long time. I don't know if you've encountered this, but we're, we're seeing a lot of this uh, in news articles and in the chat groups online and social media, the long tail uh, participants, they call them. So these people who, they get sick, they recover, but then they have this long grumbling recovery where uh, respiratory symptoms can sometimes linger and recur and the cognitive brain fog symptoms uh, are persisting. Sometimes the sleep changes are persisting. So, uh, Did you see some something uh, like this in, in SARS or any other uh, um, comparable virus, the long tail issue? Not as much. Uh, SARS, we didn't have as, uh, as, as big of a sample size, fortunately. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting when, when there have been full pandemics, um, you know, worldwide pandemics, our, our most recent example that was truly global was 100 years ago. Um, and there were some very rare uh, conditions. So the encephalitis lethargica, uh, the Awakenings movie uh, about that, that uh, was Robin Williams started many years ago, uh, was really focused on, on that. This was a, a, a subgroup of people who had the influenza outbreak of, of 1919 and then you know, got kind of stuck. Their neurological, their brain got injured and they had movement problems and they were almost frozen. Um, and so that's a sort of an example of an unexpected brain event uh, from the infection. It really, uh, retrospectively, you know, we, we haven't seen, uh, at least so far, thankfully, we haven't seen an example of that from COVID, but I think we are hearing a lot about this sort of persisting challenges. Um, you raised Spanish flu, 1918, 1919. Um, I had understood that uh, then it impacted mostly young adults, um, people 18 to 30. Uh, why would Spanish flu impact young adults while this uh, virus, COVID-19, impacting primarily the old people, the elderly? Uh, well, I, I mean, Rick's probably in a better position than I am, but, uh, you know, I would say that the, I mean, it's important to remember that we didn't have the same sort of record keeping back then as we do now. So you need to be a little bit careful, I think, about drawing comparisons between what happened back then and what happened now. Of course, people didn't live as long in 1918, 1919 as they do now. So we have an awful lot more older people now than we did back then. So, you know, I think you have to be sort of slightly careful uh, about these comparisons. So what is it I, I, about I, uh, the elderly? It's just a uh, low immune system? Well, it might not be low immune system. It might sometimes, in some cases, be overactive immune system. But I, I think it's, it's, I just want to go back a, a second, and I'm going to come back to that question, because the 1918-1919 the pandemic was really driven in large part by massive movements of young people around the globe. Uh, World War I and uh, troop movements around the globe carried the pandemic everywhere. And so... It was, it was certainly the exposure on military bases and troops and people coming home. If you look at the distribution of how it got spread and why it got spread, it was a very different phenomenology than we're seeing now. So that's one very key difference. Um, I think it was a little bit more like, uh, like SARS in that it, it was very aggressive and, so, and affected. So young, healthy people were dying uh, at, at rates higher than, than we're seeing, I think, for COVID. Um, so, so there's something about the virus. There's, there's a lot of different aspects to viruses. If you think about the spectrum, you have Ebola on one side, which is very infectious and very fatal. Lots of people get it, uh, uh, sorry, very fatal, but not as infectious. So the people who get it tend to do very, very badly, but it actually is a little bit hard to transmit. And so when they get these flare-ups, they can really clamp down on it. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, seems to be a little bit of what we're dealing with, with right now with COVID. It, it, it's very infectious. It's very easy to spread. Um, and it's uh, lethality, it's, it's, it's ability to, to really uh, 
uh, kill people is much lower than something like Ebola on a case-by-case -case basis. Measles is even further along that spectrum. It's super easy to spread, even easier than, than coronavirus. And so the characteristics and the behavior of the viruses also explain a little bit of these, of these differences. Um, I understand in, uh, I understand in the 1819 Spanish flu, more people died in the second wave than in the first wave, and that Canada may not have even experienced the first wave. It only got hit by the second wave. Is or there noticed, something? Noticed it. <laughs> maybe. Is there something about uh, the second wave? Is it, is it because it got stronger or mutated or just we let our defenses down or do you know? Um, there, there are theories that, that it did mutate, that, it, that the virus at that time became more virulent or more aggressive or introduced a, induced a, a more aggressive or, or toxic immune response. Uh, that something about the virus sort of changed between the first wave and the second wave. That's kind of, that's been out there. Um, I don't think they fully understood it at the time. Um, it is also possible with a lot of these, uh, you know, pandemic epidemiology, we're seeing, you know, once you get over a certain sort of inflection point, it gets very hard to control. And if you can keep the levels low enough, you can kind of crest the curve and come back down. And, you know, we talk about that R number, the, the number of people that get infected for each new case. Um, and once you get over a certain point, the math really runs away with itself and it gets very hard to contain. And so it's not clear, at least to me, I, I, this is not sort of a, I'm not an expert, you know, I'm, there are people out there who have done their PhDs studying the 1918 pandemic um, and, and they'd be better positioned to answer a question like this than I am. But, but to me, it, it's not entirely clear whether it was a change in the virulence and the virus itself, or whether it was more of an epidemiological problem where, uh, you know, as people went indoors more, they started spreading it and it kind of just took off past uh, a point that, that made it much harder to control. I understand that 80% of the people that are put on ventilators don't survive. Why is that statistic so terrible? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a horrible, it's a horrible statistic. I think the numbers are getting a little bit better as we're looking at better ways to treat, uh, preventing people from going on the ventilators in the first place. Um, giving them steroids uh, to prevent that inflammation, but uh, being put on a ventilator and having a machine sort of breathe for you uh, can induce changes in the body itself. Um, and uh, there's something about the, the, the illness, the, the effect on the heart and the effect on the lungs uh, that when it gets that bad that people have to be put on machines, actually forcing the air in may be causing as many problems as it's helping. Um, and so you're, you're seeing as the people, the, the mortality rate has actually dropped over, over the spring and summer since March um, from COVID because uh, we're, we're getting less aggressive with the intubation and less aggressive with the ventilation, with the amount of air and oxygen we're sort of forcing in. Um, we're kind of learning is it doesn't behave like maybe a, a, a typical pneumonia would. And so some of those ICU complications uh, are being better managed. I think we're using blood thinners uh, generally more. Uh, so there's lots of things that can happen once people are on ventilators that are that are bad. Um, that the type of people who need to be on the ventilators in the first place is also tends to be the most vulnerable, as as Dr. Owen was alluding to earlier. So if you're already uh, have heart failure and diabetes and you're 85 years old and a smoker um, and you have to go on a ventilator you're much higher risk, even aside from COVID, uh, than a 25-year-old who's healthy non-smoker, right? There's been um, uh, a lot of talk that um, people of a lower socioeconomic status, uh, people of certain races might be more prone. In your study, are you keeping race statistics and uh, income statistics? Uh, as, as much as we can, yes. We're collecting as much information as we, as we possibly can. Well, what, I mean, uh, you know, one thing that we're very interested in is, is how uh, people in different parts of the world are responding, right? And this is why we're encouraging people to do this internationally. And one of those reasons is that people do vary in terms of their socioeconomic status in different parts of the world, but also people have different access to health care. I'm interested in knowing, well, how is that affecting it? You know, is, is the, the access to whatever, whatever health care you have available to you, is that a factor that is influencing how long term the sort of knock on effects of COVID-19 are? So, yes, I mean, we're trying to collect as much information as we can because you know, all of these things are interesting and, and very much unknown at this stage.
I just don't understand why race would be an issue. Is it, or is it that potentially race leads to a different, in some cases, a different and worse socioeconomic status and therefore better diet and diabetes or something like that? So there's a lot of confounds for sure. So especially in the U S but, but even in Canada, uh, rates of diabetes are higher and diabetes has definitely been associated with poor outcomes in COVID. Um, so that's one sort of obvious confound as you talked about access to health care. Again, in the U S this is a, uh, a huge problem, even in Canada, um, the, the access, uh, you know, can you take time off work? Can you drive, you know, the socioeconomic confounds there, uh, can you get to the healthcare, uh, you know, can you get to the clinic? Can you get access to the medicines you need? Can you afford your medicines? Uh, these are, these are big issues. Um, when you look at, uh, living conditions, so, um, and, and job exposures, I think that's a lot of COVID-19, uh, issues in, in sort of ethnicity and socioeconomic inequities relate to job conditions. So who are the people who are working at farms, for example, so the migrant farm workers migrant is farm a workers. classic example, right? Frontline um, workers, long-term care workers. Exactly. We're chatting with uh, Dr. Owen and Dr. Swartz, uh, two gentlemen, uh, both uh, professors uh, um, in, uh, in uh, one's a neurologist and the other one is in cognitive neuroscience um, about the impact of, con of COVID-19 on the brain. We're gonna take a break and come back in just a minute for some concluding comments. Stay with us. Well, I found tonight's conversation incredibly fascinating with uh, Dr. Adrian Owen and Dr. Rich uh, Rick uh, Swartz. Uh, uh, professor Owen is a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Western Ontario, and Dr. Rick Swartz is a neurologist at Sunnybrook Hospital and a professor at the University of Toronto. And they've started a study on the impact of COVID-19 on brains. And uh, they want you, if you've had co uh, COVID-19, whether you're asymptomatic or symptomatic or gone to the hospital or even in the ICU, to go to, what's it called, the website? COVIDbrainstudy.com covidbrainstudy.com and register and answer a bunch of questions and do some tests because what they want to do is they want to study this on an ongoing basis. Um, gentlemen, you know, for the last couple of minutes, I've had uh, one person, two professors from the University of Lethbridge talk about um, uh, cannabis uh, potentially being a great uh, uh, immu immu no suppressant, is that the right word? Um, and, uh, and it could be uh, helpful for people dealing with, uh, with COVID-19. And then I had a, uh, a PhD student at Ryerson that talked about psychedelics, potentially uh, helping some of the brain impacts. Um, what are some of the potential uh, remedies for COVID-19? No bleach. No bleach. And what's the other one that Trump keeps talking about? Hydroxychloroquine. And, and so that's a, a no as well, correct? Yeah, the randomized controlled trials, there have been several of them now, show no benefit from hydroxychloroquine. It's a, it's a very good drug. It is an immune suppressant. We use it in patients with lupus or other autoimmune diseases. Um, it, it can be used safely, but it has to be used carefully. Uh, but it, it has shown no benefit at all. Uh, and it's especially concerning to me that all the people touting it seem to have financial stakes in it. So um, I think I'd be very skeptical of those claims. Mild steroids? Mild steroids have been proven, uh, so this is not something I would self-medicate for, but people who are confirmed, uh, so people who are hospitalized with COVID, it reduces the need to get into the ICU, it improves survival uh, by about a third. Uh, so dexamethasone is a, is a the steroid that was studied in the randomized trials, and that's been, uh, I, I think, a, a big breakthrough uh, a few months ago in, in improving Cannabis, survival. Cannabis, psychedelics, any, anything there? Uh, not that we know of yet. I think I think all the trials are still open, and you know, as Dr. Owen was saying, this is this is early days. Um, we we really don't know. There's not a lot of you know by parallel to other outbreaks and other pneumonias and other viral illnesses. Not a lot that makes me think that these will be wonder drugs. Um, and mechanistically, there's not a lot that makes me think that this will be. Uh, that helpful. We do know that marijuana and psychedelics can have effects on the brain and effects on cognition. Um, the, the obvious sort of short-term ones, but they can have long-term effects. Uh, young adults who take marijuana are more likely, it actually is a risk factor for developing schizophrenia. It can have, uh, you know, cognitive effects long-term, especially high-dose users. I think, uh, Dr. Owen, you, I don't know if you want to comment on those ideas. Yeah, I mean, all of these things are true. Of course, um, uh, that, that, that doesn't mean it's going to have any uh, particularly positive effect on, on the symptoms that people are experiencing with COVID-19. So, I mean, I think it's just really important that we, uh, you know, we, 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 we keep these things in, in the right frame. And even if, even if we know that something could be good for cognition, 
Uh, there are certain drugs that are called cognitive enhancers that are known to improve cognition, but that's outside of COVID-19. We have to be very careful that we keep this uh, you know, specifically related to what's going on with this virus and this virus's effects on the brain. Dr. Adrian Owen, a Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at University of Western Ontario, and Dr. Rick Swartz, a neurologist at Center Brook Hospital, Professor of Medicine at U of T. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, and thanks for researching the impact of COVID-19 uh, COVID on the brain. One last time, what's the website people should go to? COVIDBrainStudy.com. COVIDBrainStudy.com. Well, that's the Brian Crombie Radio Hour uh, for tonight. Please join us every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock or stream.